meaningful acts done kind of graphically according to the evangelist St. Mark where we have Jesus being in a home teaching. We often see Jesus outside in, uh, on the road teaching or preaching in a meadow or in a valley or by the seaside or on a boat. We see him in various kind of settings and today we see him in a home meaning that someone invited him into their home and as was his custom he typically drew a very large crowd because of his very charismatic nature and because people truly wanted to listen to what he had to say because his message was not simply a repetition of the scriptures of the old testament scriptures there was a charisma in his message that drew people to want to love god and embrace him whereas the preaching at the time of christ through the rabbis, through the Pharisees, and through the scribes was one of judgment, was one of condemnation. And Christ had a different message. And although his message was contradictory in many ways to the style of preaching of the Pharisees, nevertheless, people were drawn to him and wanted to believe that there is a goodness in God, that sanctity has nothing to do with fear, but it has to do with the goodness of God. So Jesus is in the home. And there are uh, people filling the inside of the house. And there was a man who was paralyzed. By our definition today, he may have been a quadriplegic or a paraplegic. He obviously could not move his limbs. He was not able to get around. He depended on the support of family or friends. As it turned out, these, this particular paralytic, this paralyzed man, happened to have four friends, countrymen, who also wanted to come to listen to Christ's preaching. But they also believed that Christ's power, his preaching ability, and his grace was able even to heal this man. And they wanted to do everything they could to bring this man into physical contact, if at all possible, with Christ. So what did they do? They were not able to go through the front door because it was packed to capacity. It was standing room only. There was no way that they could have moved inside. But it was important for them to make this contact. And then they were afraid that even if they stood in the courtyard of the house, that somehow Jesus would be uh, taken away somewhere else and that they wouldn't be able to see him. But they truly, truly wanted their friend to come into contact with the Lord. And so they did the unthinkable. And what is unusual is not so much that they tore off the roof, the roof was probably a straw roof or had uh, planks on it that they were easily removable. It was not that they removed the roof to lower the man in. It's the fact that they disregarded any kind of embarrassment. Because doing something like this is highly unusual. Rather than focusing in on Christ's message, everyone would be focusing on them. And they didn't do this so that people could focus on them. They felt desperate, and they felt a need, a need to help, to find Christ, to support their friend. They were willing to be ridiculed, to be reprimanded, and they went and did this act anyway. And so they lowered the man after removing part of the roof into the house on his pallet. So obviously the attention now from Christ is going to be drawn to this man who is being lowered in. And Jesus, the Gospel says, was impressed by the faith of these four men. These four men took the chance of being ridiculed and reprimanded. And God doesn't look at what we think. He looks at how much faith we have. 
or what others think of us, but how much faith do we have? And Jesus comes over to this man, and he says to him, and this is what's very interesting, you have to read a little bit between the lines. He says to him, your sins are forgiven you. What do I mean by reading in between the lines? The man himself may have been in a position where he couldn't express what he wanted. He may have been as a, a quadriplegic or a paraplegic. He may not have had the faculties of his mouth. He may not have been able to speak what he wanted. He didn't say, Lord, forgive me my sins, make me better. The gospel tells us, or does he tell us, he didn't say a word. He was completely silent. And all that Jesus was basing his actions on was on the faith of the four men. Jesus acts, not because the man had asked him to help him. Jesus asks because of the powerful support of the faith of the four others. It was their faith that saved the man. Now normally we hear in the gospel, it is faith that saves. Not in this case. Well, it is faith, but not the faith of the man. It's the faith of the others. It was the prayer of the others. The earnest of the others to help. It was their courage to undergo ridicule if necessary, but it was their faith that helped their friend. And Jesus walks up to him, and looking happily at the men, the four men, he looks at the men and he says, your sins are forgiven you. Now all of this is going on because we have here two focal points. We have Christ as teacher, Christ as healer, and the other focal point is the man. And in the periphery, we have the faithful people, the people who are there listening to the word of God. And then we have the cynicism of the Pharisees. Those who are looking at all of this happening, and they're disgusted. They're disgusted with what's happening here. It could very well be that this happened on the Sabbath, in which case then, first of all, never mind Jesus healing on the Sabbath, which was taboo according to the interpretation of the Jewish law, but the fact that the men removed the roof, this was a, this was a work, completely taboo, a great sin, a grave sin for the Jews. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. The cynical Pharisees, who were there, the scribes, are indignant, they're angry, they're furious, furious. But they don't say anything, because they were afraid of confrontation. Jesus realizes what they are thinking in their hearts. And he looks at them intensely, and he says, excuse me. What is easier to say? And he's, by this, he's trying to provide a lesson, a very important lesson. He says, what's easier to, to, uh, to do? Is it to say to the paralytic, oh, your sins are forgiven you? I mean, I can go up to anybody here and say, oh, you know what? Nick, your sins are forgiven you. That's very easy to say, right? Has it happened? No. Because I'm not God. But if God says your sins are forgiven you, then it's true. But how do we know that Jesus is God? Because Jesus then does the impossible. And then he says, so that you know that the Son of Man, referring to himself, so that you know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, I'm going to show you something that's even harder than someone saying, I forgive sins. Lou, I forgive your sins. Okay, wonderful, that's easy. Did it happen? He says, let me prove it. And he turns to the man, and he heals him. And what does he do? He doesn't put his hand on him, at least we don't have the details from the Gospel of Mark. He may very well have done that. But what does he do? He goes over him and he says, Rise, my son, take up your pallet, take up your bed, and walk. He doesn't say a prayer over him, may God heal you, may God the Father heal you. He doesn't say anything like that. He looks at him and he says, Take up your pallet and walk. Where is God? 
God's strength unleashed? What, where does God's strength come from? It comes from God. But what releases the healing power? Not the faith of the man, because the man was paralyzed. The faith of the four men. The faith of the four men releases God's healing power. And then the gospel pericope ends with Mark saying, the people saying, we have never seen anything like this. Not just the healing, but the fact that a man forgives and then he heals. And then not only does Jesus heal, but it's the faith of the men that, ever, that becomes so obvious that unleashes God's power to heal this man. This miracle is another example of how God incorporates us into the miracle of healing. It is God who heals, but God will not heal if we do not consent. If we do not say, we do not pray and ask God for healing, God will not heal us. And actually the healing is not simply the hand of God, it's also the will of man. The miracles happen, as you've heard me say before, even in the, in the divine liturgy. What transforms the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ? Truly, the Holy Trinity. How? Through the prayer of the church. Through the prayer of the priest praying on behalf of the people, and the people sealing the prayer through their Amen. This is what we call in Orthodox theology, synergy. Synergy means man and God working together. Both are necessary. Both are absolutely necessary. If we were to come here and simply all stare at the altar and not say a word, and we see bread and wine on the altar, and we don't say a word, does the miracle of transformation happen? Is the bread and wine the Eucharist? I'm just asking you right now. If we don't say anything, if we just stand there, does anything happen? Is God present? Yes. Is the grace of God there? Of course it is. Does the miracle happen? No way. Why? Because we are co-creators with God. Remember from the book of Genesis. I don't want to bore you with details, but this is important to know. Go back to the book of Genesis. When God creates man and woman, he goes to the man and he waits to see what the man is going to call the animals in the animal kingdom. And the and scripture says, whatever the man called them, that was their name. God gives to us the power to create and to order and to work with him. We are his co-laborers in the vineyard. He gives us life. He gives us wisdom. He gives us tools and resources and knowledge. And we take this and we work with him. We work with him to do beautiful things, to cultivate that which he gives us. He is the owner, the creator. He is the one who provides the garden. And we are the gardeners. And we are the ones who are here to work with him with what he gives us, faithfully working together with the Lord. And this is what we do as Christians. So the miracle that happened today is the miracle of the consent of the friends to bring healing to their friend. Very important. What does this mean for us in our lives? I think it's pretty obvious. We exist in this life for one another. We exist in this life so that we can see the image of God in one another. So that we can give God to one another. You heard me on Friday, those of you who were here, the sermon that I preached at the end, I said that we are to love one another, and that simply means not to give people an emotion, not to show them we love them. It doesn't mean only to do acts of kindness towards them, those are part and parcel of love, it's true, how we express through our being and what we do. But if we truly want to love someone, we have to give them Christ. 
Even if they don't believe in Christ, that's okay. They will. Because when you give someone Christ, you give them the fullness of love. Love, you know, this is an interesting thing. I remember having a conversation once with Metropolitan Savas, and I said, do you know how limited we are? And he says, you're into your philosophical mood again. And he says, what do you mean by that? I says, let me explain to you. The moment we use a word, a word confines us. A word is something that it's part of human language. We come up with a word, and that word tells us something about what we're thinking. But what we think is limited. So if I say love, what is love? People have different definitions of love, right? But if you want to go beyond our confined notion of love, then you have to go to the extreme. And what is the extreme? We have to go above love. And what is above love? God. God is the fullness of love. So we have to give each other Christ. When we give each other Christ, we give love in its fullest uh, expression. It's just like when we say the word God. You know, when we say the word God, we know what we mean to a degree, because nobody knows who God fully is. But when we say God, we're confining him. We're saying, who's God? Okay, he's Jesus Christ. I mean, that's confining. Who is God? God is love. That's confining him. So what do the fathers of the church call God? God is everything above our knowledge of him. Greater than even what we think he is. So who is God? God is hypertheos, hyper God. Because when we come outside the confines of language, then we allow God to be free. And so what do we call God? Hypertheos, he who is above our understanding of and how above is he? There's no limits. And so we free God. And love, we can free love. We can free this concept of love by bringing it to its fullest and saying that it is Christ. And beyond Christ and God, there's nothing. So coming back to this, we are here to support each other and to give each other Christ. We are the ones who carry each other, because all of us have a form of paralysis. We are all ill, spiritually ill. There's not, none of us here who is not ill, and we all need one another. And a lot of times we go through life not being able to move our limbs, move our bodies, make decisions, find comfort on our own. And what do we need? We need to be carried through life. And who carries us? The people who truly love us. The people who truly are concerned. Those are the people that will take the four ends of our bed, because we're all on spiritual beds. And we move through life. Sometimes we carry our bed, and we stumble. And then we're so flat out that we don't know what to do. And then we have to call out for help. And what happens? Someone comes. And they help us. Because they love us, they care about us. And then when we're able to walk and we're on our feet, then we return the favor because everyone at some point in their life will often stumble. And it's not just stumbling, it's also being paralyzed. What do we do? We need to call out to each other. We're here to support each other. St. John Chrysostom, and you've heard me use this quote before several times, St. John Chrysostom says, that the rich exist to save the poor. They're there, that God has given them their ability to, uh, that God has given them their wealth, so that they can learn themselves to love and to help the poor. The poor need assistance. Because there is, unfortunately, in our world. But at the same time, he says, the poor exist to save the rich, because without the poor, the rich don't have an opportunity to love. Because a person who's rich, does not always look outside of his own wealth and his own comfort. But the poor are there to remind the rich that God also loves them if they will in turn love those less fortunate. So even in the uh, difficult and, and kind of unusual circumstances of life, the hand of God is there. And he is calling us to remember to support one another, to support each other, to help each other with our palates, 
And it is our faith, it is our prayer, our prayers that support and help the other person. Do not underestimate the power of prayer. It is the most powerful force known to man. Because when you pray with the purity of heart and keep your prayer simple and clean, and you begin your prayer always in thanksgiving, never asking, always thanking first, and then asking God for the needs of others, God is there. What helps a priest get through a liturgy? The prayers of the people. What helps a family during difficult times? The prayer of the church. Prayer is a force. It's an invisible force. And where there is love, where there is prayer, there is love. And when we love, we give people Christ. And that's why Christ is the only one who can heal. It's actually very simple if you think about it. We have to love. When we love, we bring Christ into the picture. When Christ is in the picture, he heals. That is how the four friends help their friend, the paralytic, be healed. They loved him. They did everything. They, they had courage and hope. And they did what they had to do. And they showed love. And Christ was present. And that love for that man released God's healing energy. This is how the mystery of God works in the world, brothers and sisters. There's nothing magical about it. There's nothing more complex about it. It's very, very, very simple. When we love, miracles happen. Because we bring God into the picture. So I wanted to share with you these uh, few thoughts this morning in the, in the hope that our paralysis, our life, may be transformed by the love that others show to us and the love that we show to others. It is this love that is redeeming. It is this love that is transformative. It is this love that saves. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What brought Christ to the cross? What brought Christ first into the world? Then to the cross, then to the resurrection. Love. Where there is love, there is the power and the presence of God. May God bless us to have this power. Simply by loving one another and being ready to carry each other's beds throughout this clinic called life.